now turn to section 1. Section 1. You will hear a student talking to the accommodation coordinator at her school. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. You'll see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Sarah, I've heard that you want to move into a homestay family. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. I've been staying with my aunt, and now my cousin is arriving from Singapore, and my aunt needs the room for him. Ah, oh, that's bad luck. Well, I'll need to get some particulars first. Um, Sarah, what's your full name? Sarah Lim. And that's Sarah without the H at the end. Linda asks for Sarah's full name, Sarah Lim, so this has been written in the notes. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Sarah, I've heard that you want to move into a homestay family. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. I've been staying with my aunt, and now my cousin is arriving from Singapore, and my aunt needs the room for him. Oh, that's bad luck. Well, I'll need to get some particulars first. Um, Sarah, what's your full name? Sarah Lim. And that's Sarah without the H at the end. Mm -hmm. How old are you, Sarah? 23, only just. It was my birthday on the 21st of August. Oh, happy birthday for yesterday. How long have you been in Australia? A year in Adelaide and six months in Sydney. I prefer Sydney. I've got more friends here. What's your address at your aunt's house? Flat one. 539 Forest Road, Canterbury. And the postcode is 2036. OK. What are you studying now? I was studying General English in Adelaide, and now I'm doing Academic English because I'm trying to get into medicine next year. That sounds good, but it'll take you a long time. When would you like to move out from your aunt's? My cousin arrives on Friday morning, so I'd better be out on Thursday. What, the 7th of September? Yes, that's right. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. That doesn't leave us much time. Right, OK. I need to know what kind of accommodation you'd like so I can get you something suitable. Can I share a room with someone else? I've been alone in my room at my aunt's and I've always shared with my sister and I like that. Yes, fine. That'll save you money too. <laughs> Would you like to live with a family, or do you think that a single person would be better for you? I have lots of very nice single people on my books. Do you have any women living alone, retired women? Yes. I have quite a few whose children have grown up and left home. In fact, I have some really lovely retired ladies living by themselves who just love the company of students. Most of them live in flats, but that's not a problem for you, is it? Not at all. I'm used to that. My aunt lives in a flat too, remember? Hmm. I'm not used to a big house with a garden, swimming pool, pets and all that. OK, fine. I know quite a bit about what you want now. I should let you know that your rent will be $160 per week. 
You'll have to pay me $320 as a deposit before you move in. The deposit is as insurance in case you break something. You'll need to pay monthly to me by cash or check, I don't mind. You don't need to pay for gas, electricity or water, but you will need to pay your proportion of the phone bill. Most families do that on an honour system, but you'll have to wait and see. Mm. Have you got any more questions for me? Uh, when will you know where I can go? I'll work on it now. So come and see me tomorrow and I should have some news for you then. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. See you tomorrow. After lunch will be better for me. OK. See you then. Bye. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Listening section 2. You will hear the principal of a university welcoming his students. Look at questions 11 to 17. Listen to the first part of the lecture and answer questions 11 to 17. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Donovan, the principal of Don Levy University, and I would like to welcome you to the Dinglewood campus, which is one of the three campuses belonging to this university. This campus, Dinglewood, is where I have my office, and it's also the location of the Languages and Science campus, so some of you will be studying here. Dinglewood is the most northerly campus. The business studies blocks are in the Churchdown campus in the center of town, and the southern or Trailway campus, where history and architecture are situated, is to the south of the town. Those of you who are enrolled in any of those courses will be taken to your respective buildings at the end of this meeting. Those of you studying on the Dinglewood campus, you will have a tour later too. This building we are assembled in is the office or administration block, block 39, and is where the weekly meetings are held. You are welcome to attend these meetings, as are all the university staff. You may want to, as many university issues are discussed at these weekly meetings. The meetings take place at 1.30 every Tuesday, so please stop by. Two other important buildings are also located on this campus, the cafeteria and the on-site shop. You can purchase all the required books and any stationery you need for your courses at this shop. Please bear in mind that even though you have shown your ID passes to enter the site, you still need to use them again to buy anything in the shop or cafeteria. This is for security reasons. Now look at questions 18 to 20.
As the lecture continues, answer questions 18 to 20. Now, if I could draw your attention to the back page of your joining instructions booklet, you will see a small map of this campus, Dingle Wood. The block we are in now, the Office and Administration block, is located between the Languages Centre, Block 38, and the Physics School, Block 30, that's 3-0. These are both on the right of the plan. The cafeteria, which is open from 7am to 9.30pm, is on the left of the plan. It is between the chemistry block, number 35, and the university shop, block 33. At the university shop, you can get all you will need in terms of course materials. The biology block is block number 29, and you'll find the biology block between the chemistry block and the languages centre. Be careful with the numbers, as they are not always logical. As you will see, there are gardens on the right-hand side of the gate. These are being extended over the next two months, and a memorial fountain is being installed in the middle of the campus. This means that the campus will be very noisy during normal working hours. However, the campus will look much nicer when it is all finished. Right, so that's it for your initial campus orientation. At this point, could the language students all follow me, please? And the rest of you, please assemble under the banners which show your main topic of study, and you will be directed to the other campuses. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3. You will hear a conversation between a lecturer and two horticulture students who are preparing a display for a science fair. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good morning, Annie. Tony, how are you? Fine, thanks. Well, tell me what you have here. We thought we'd look at different methods of hydroculture. Uh-huh. In the true hydroponics method, the roots are bathed with water and nutrient solution while support for the plant must be provided above the container. And alternatively? Alternatively, the plants can grow with their roots in a substratum, such as sand, vermiculite, or LECA granules. LECA stands for Lightweight Expanded Clay Aggregate, and vermiculite is... Thank you, Tony. I know what vermiculite is but you should be prepared to give details about all these things to the visitors. Can you explain what the advantage of LECA is over traditional soil? It's a natural product, manufactured from clay. It's colorful, lightweight, and perfect for allergy sufferers. That's right. Now tell me why. Because it's clean and hygienic, bacteria and soil diseases don't get a chance. Well, you could say that on this chart here, ideal for household plants. And we'll point out that the growing medium itself makes no contribution to feeding, which is provided in solution with the water. Good. 
Now tell me what you've got here. This is a simple version of the first method, using a wide neck jar which we've filled with water and nutrients, leaving space at the top. As the roots need to be in darkness, we'll cover the sides of the glass with brown paper later. How did you get the plant through the cork? We made a hole through the center and cut the cork in half so we could fit it around the plant stem, and we padded the hole with cotton wool. Well, that's a good demonstration of the principle involved and ideal for a house plant, but many people will want to see a wider application. What about more plants? We haven't quite finished the preparation yet, but over here you can see a bigger container. In fact, any wide container can be used, with the nutrient solution in the bottom, airspace above, and then we've made a rigid lid, and we've covered that with a layer of litter. What have you used for litter? We've used wood shavings. Untreated? Definitely. That's most important. You can use a variety of materials for litter, but obviously nothing toxic and treated timber contains some nasty chemicals. So, if you're using sawdust or wood shavings, they have to be from natural timber. A good point. Yes, we'll make a note of that when we list possible ingredients for litter. Be sure to explain the purpose of the rigid lid. It's wire mesh, isn't it? And why the litter layer is important, too. Well, the mesh is just a platform to keep the litter out of the water, and the primary function of the litter is to exclude light from the root space. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Hmm. What do you have so far is ideal for the home or office, but what about commercial applications? Well, we're going to demonstrate the nutrient film technique, which is popular with some commercial growers, particularly for the cultivation of crops such as runner beans and tomatoes. Producers would really like to see some innovation in the cultivation of potatoes and yams, too. But obviously, this technique is only suitable for those crops which grow above ground. What about peas? Well, we found peas were awfully tricky to grow using this method, although we're still unsure as to the reason. Where's the exhibit? I don't see it anywhere. Well, that's because we haven't finished it yet because we're going to have to procure some mature plants first. We didn't think far enough ahead to have started them off earlier, and when we do get them, we'll have to handle them carefully. Yes, because when our model is finished, you'll see how the plants are held in position by a plastic tube, which almost encloses them completely and is quite loosely fastened around the stems. Yes, and the feeding or watering system? Well, it's a bit different. On a large scale like this, you need to have the food solution trickle down through the tubes. Yes, but the solution must also be rich in oxygen. And what? It just bathes the roots? That's one way of doing it. What's the other way? You can have the solution moistening a substratum of rock wool at the bottom of the container. Rock wool? It's the same as mineral wool. You know, a lightweight, fibrous material, the kind of thing used for insulation. Or you can use a layer of paper fiber. Oh, yes, something that has the capacity to absorb the solution, right? Well, you do need to experiment a little. For example, we tried coconut fiber. But it just didn't have the properties we were looking for. I see. In our display, you'll only see the basics. The kind of thing that can be done at home, in the backyard. But commercial enterprises do need a lot more equipment, and the media used in substrata are constantly changing as new developments are made. The cost of upgrading is ongoing. 
and there's always the potential of outright failure when changing systems from one you know and understand to an innovative one. Of course, there's no room for guesswork in business. You have to try to get everything right first time. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a postgraduate psychology student talking to other students about a job satisfaction study he has investigated. Before you listen, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. For my presentation today, I'm going to report on an assignment that I did recently. My brief was to analyze the methods used in a small study about job satisfaction and then to make recommendations for future studies of a similar kind. The study that I looked at had investigated the relationship between differences in gender and differences in working hours and levels of job satisfaction amongst workers. For this purpose, employees at a call center had been asked to complete a questionnaire about their work. I'll summarize the findings of that study briefly now. First of all, female full-time workers reported slightly higher levels of job satisfaction than male full-time workers. Secondly, female part-time workers reported slightly higher levels of satisfaction than female full-time ones did. On the other hand, male part-time workers experienced slightly less job satisfaction than male full-time workers. But although these results seemed interesting and capable of being explained, Perhaps the most important thing to mention here is that in statistical terms, they were inconclusive. Personally, I was surprised that the findings hadn't been more definite, because I would have expected to find that men and women, as well as full and part-time workers, would experience different levels of satisfaction. So I then looked more carefully at the methodology employed by the researchers, to see where there may have been problems. This is what I found. First of all, the size of the sample was probably too small. The overall total of workers who took part in the survey was 223, which sounds quite a lot, but they had to be divided up into subgroups. Also, the numbers in the different subgroups were unequal. For example, there were 154 workers in the full-time group, but only 69 in the part-time group. And amongst this part-time group, only 10 were male, compared to 59 who were female. Secondly, although quite a large number of people had been asked to take part in the survey, the response was disappointingly low. A lot of them just ignored the invitation. And workers who did respond may have differed in important respects from those who didn't. Thirdly, as the questionnaires had been posted to the call center for distribution, 
the researchers had had very limited control over the conditions in which participants completed them. For instance, their responses to questions may have been influenced by the views of their colleagues. All these problems may have biased the results. In the last part of my assignment, I made recommendations for a similar study, attempting to remove the problems that I've just mentioned. Firstly, a much larger sample should be targeted, and care should be taken to ensure that equal numbers of both genders and both full and part-time workers are surveyed. Secondly, the researchers should ensure that they are present to administer the questionnaires to the workers themselves. And should they require the workers to complete the questionnaire under supervised conditions so that the possibility of influence from other colleagues is eliminated? Finally, as workers may be unwilling to provide details of their job satisfaction when they are on work premises, it's important that the researchers reassure them that their responses will remain confidential and also that they have the right to withdraw from the study at any time if they want to. By taking measures like these, the reliability of the responses to the questionnaires is likely to be increased, and any comparisons that are made are likely to be more valid. So, that was a summary of my assignment. Does anyone have any questions? That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.